uh, we were discussing about properties of Fourier transform in the previous class, and we talked about several properties, linearity, time shifting, conjugation, uh, differentiation, integration, duality, which was a very important property, and then Parseval's relation, which uh, talks about the spectral energy density and the total energy in the signal itself. So today we are going to talk about convolution and the dual part uh, and, and also a dual relationship with respect to convolution and uh, what it means in the context of Fourier transform. Okay, so we had recall from the Fourier series discussion that when you take two periodic signals and you take their convolution in the Fourier series. Um, uh, what we see is summation a k times b n minus k k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, and this was the convolution operator. Fourier series coefficients. Okay, this is something we had discussed in the context of Fourier series, and we had derived this expression in one of the earlier lectures. Now today, uh, let's try to do it for Fourier transform. So I have two signals, xt with Fourier transform. So these were periodic signals in the case of Fourier series. And now we are talking about aperiodic signals. So I have two aperiodic signals that satisfy Dirichlet's condition. And I know the Fourier transform for each of these signals. It's X of J omega and Y of J omega. I have two signals, aperiodic signals. They satisfy Dirichlet conditions. Therefore, I can take their Fourier transform. Now, if I do the convolution of these two aperiodic signals, then the Fourier transform turns out to be the multiplication of the two signals, uh, of the two Fourier transform. Okay, and we'll look at the look into the proof uh, in, a, in a few minutes after we understand what the consequence of this particular result is. So convolution, this is typically uh, in, in words you say, convolution in time domain is product in Fourier domain. Does this only apply to aperiodic signals? Because I thought this applied to everything. Well, it. For periodic signals, this is the expression. So in the periodic signal, okay. take the convolution of Fourier series coefficient. And for the aperiodic case, you just multiply the Fourier transform. Okay. Yeah. So this certainly, I mean, uh, we, we know how to deal with, I mean, how to 
do the Fourier transform for periodic signals as well. This is something that we talked about, I think, in, oh, there it is. So continuous time Fourier transform for periodic signal. We did that in lecture 16, and we talked about how to do Fourier transform for that, for periodic signal. So it holds even for periodic signals, as long as you do the Fourier transform according to this uh, lecture 16 methodology. Okay, so you're right in saying that this holds more generally. It definitely holds in all situations. As long as you can take the Fourier transform of individual signals, you can take the Fourier transform of the uh, convolution of the two time series, uh, two signals of time, and that will be the product in the Fourier domain. Now the dual relationship implies that if I have product in the time domain, then the Fourier transform is one over two pi x j omega convolution with y j omega. And this is usually said, like in, in, in words, in plain words, you will say product in time domain is convolution in Fourier domain. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so let's look at the first part and then we will look at the second part. Perhaps we won't get to the second part in this class. So we'll talk about this dual relationship in the class on Monday. But let's look at the first part, which is convolution in time domain is product in Fourier domain. What's the duty of this particular equation? So X convolution Y is same as X multiplied by Y. So this is what we are talking about. Let's backtrack to lecture eight. I want to solve the following differential equation. dy over dt plus a yt equals to xt and xt is given by e raised to minus bt ut. And A and B, both of them are greater than zero. So I have a differential equation. I have a input. So this is a system equation. This is the system dynamics. Uh, XT is the input to the system, YT is the output to the system. Uh, and, and I know the input is going to be an exponential signal. So in lecture eight, we discussed one way to solve this problem. And method one, actually we discussed two ways to solve the problem. Anyone remembers what the first method was, the most laborious way to solve this problem? Who 
who remembers from lecture eight? Is that just finding the homogeneous and particular solutions? Right, right. So that was the usual differential equation method for solving this problem, which is using homogeneous and particular solution. So that was one method to solve the problem. Very tedious. You first have to compute the homogeneous solution, then particular solution, then use the initial conditions to derive the coefficients. And that took about 15 or 20 minutes to solve this problem. Then there was a second method. Can someone tell me? what the second method was? We discussed it also in lecture eight. Anyone remembers? So compute the impulse response of the system. And for this particular system, we had derived that the impulse response of the system is going to be e raised to negative at ut. That's the impulse response for this first order differential equation. So after we have computed the impulse response, then I can derive the expression for yt, which is a convolution of the input with the impulse response of the system. And this relationship holds because we have an LTI system. And after doing this integration in lecture eight, we found that actually yt is given by one over b minus a e raised to minus at minus e raised to minus bt ut. Okay, so now method one was of course quite uh, complicated. Uh, method two was not that complicated, but still you had to carry out the convolution equation. And it involves some integral change of variables, this and that. Um, and, and then you were able to uh, do the convolution and come up with the expression for yt. Okay, now in this class, I'm going to talk about the third method, which is use Fourier transform. And in the Fourier transform case, we know that X T convolution H T, the Fourier transform of this expression is going to be uh, x j omega on h capital H of j omega. And this is the frequency response of the system.
Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so we have a differential equation. I want to solve this differential equation. Uh, I can use it, go back to the differential equation class, solve it using the homogeneous and particular solution approach. Very tedious, I don't want to do it. Then came the second method, which we taught, which, which uh, we learned in lecture eight, where if I knew the impulse response of the system, which I could use a table, of differential equations to figure out what the impulse response of the system is. So I can find this part out very easily. Once I find it out, I just have to take the convolution and then I can get the uh, response of the system. And that is also maybe take some amount of effort and change of variables and integration and whatnot. Now let's look at the third case where I just take the Fourier transform of individual signals and then use a partial fraction approach to compute the value of yt. So that's what we are gonna talk about next. So I know that if you have a signal e raised to minus at ut, the Fourier transform for this signal is given by, we had derived it in the class a plus j omega. So this implies H of J omega is So I know that y of j omega is h multiplied by x, which is Everything is fairly straightforward. Now let's recall the partial fraction approach. I can write Y of J omega as A over where A would be an unknown coefficient Now A and B are unknown coefficients here. And the goal is to compute the values of A and B. Has any of you seen partial fraction approach before? Rather, have all of you seen the partial fraction approach before? It's been a while. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, good. So we'll just review this uh, somewhat quickly. So I don't know these coefficients a and b. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to expand this whole uh, summation thing. So I get a multiplied by b plus j omega, a plus j omega, and this should be equal to one. Right. So in the denominator, I have a plus j omega multiplied by b plus j omega, and I have the same thing on the right side. So those gets cancelled. And so I'm left with a 
multiplied by b plus j omega plus b multiplied by a plus j omega. So Okay, so I have done some calculation. I uh, co collected all the terms containing the constants together, all the terms containing the J together. And I wrote the right-hand side also in terms of a complex number, I plus J zero, one plus J zero. Now, what are the two equations and two unknowns that I have by inspecting this equation? I have two unknowns, which is A and B, but what are the two equations that we got to solve this problem? You can individually set the real and imaginary parts equal to each other. Right, so set the real part and the imaginary part equal to each other. So I have AB plus BA equals to one and then omega a plus b equals to zero. So I have two equations and two unknowns. A and b are unknowns, capital A and capital B are unknowns. And I now have two equations so I can solve this problem. Uh, so this equation tells me a equals to minus b. And if I substitute it here, I get a b minus a equal to one, which means a equals to one over b minus a. And b equals to minus a, so one minus one over b minus a. Okay, all of you familiar with this, uh, not familiar, but perhaps recall this step from when you had last seen the partial fraction approach. I don't follow what happened when you pulled, um, when you had, when you went from AB plus BA equals one to A times parentheses B minus A equals one. What happened there? Oh, oh. Uh, so A equals to minus B we have this from the second equation. So I then sub uh, B equals okay. minus A here. So I sub, let me write it in a different color. So I substituted B equals to minus A from here. And now I got the value of A and B. And I am going to substitute this value of A and B here in this expression. So let's see what I get. One over B minus A, one over A plus J omega, one over B minus A, one over B plus J omega. So I get one over B minus A. Okay, so, my, so I wanted to find y of t. I found y of j omega. Now what do I do? How do I find y of t?
Well, I can take the inverse Fourier transform of Y of J omega, and you can look at the Fourier transform table and you will notice that the inverse Fourier transform of one over A plus J omega is given by E raised to minus A T U T. And the inverse Fourier transform of one over B plus J omega is given by E raised to negative B T U T. This is just the linearity, the linearity, linearity property of Fourier transform. So I'm using My y of j omega is uh, sum of two uh, components, one over a plus j omega and negative one over b plus j omega. I can take the inverse Fourier transform, add it up, we get the solution yt. Okay, this is the third approach for solving the same differential equation problem that uh, we had solved in lecture eight. Of course, uh, needless to say, we get the same expression for yt. I mean, the output is not going to change just because the approach has changed. So we get the same result, but now let's, let's go back and see the specific steps employed in getting this particular result. So there are things called Fourier series or Fourier transform tables. So from those tables, I found these expressions. Then I computed the value of y of j omega computed the value of y of j omega. Once I computed the value of y of j omega, I just used the partial fraction approach to compute the values of a and b. Substituted it in the value of y of j omega. Got this expression for y of j omega, which is sum of two different Fourier transforms. And then I took the inverse Fourier transform, applied the linearity uh, property of inverse Fourier transform to derive the expression for Y of T. So just by having a table of Fourier transform of signals, I can very easily compute the response of systems for given inputs, as long as the Fourier transform of those inputs can be computed easily. This whole approach was only possible because of the following reason. Where did that reason go? Because of this reason. So the reason is that if you have convolution in time domain, then it's equivalent to multiplication in Fourier domain. Uh, then I can use the partial fraction to separate the multiplication into specific uh, Fourier transform, like sum of Fourier transforms. And then I take the inverse Fourier transform to get the signal y of t. Okay, so that's the beauty of this particular result that convolution in time domain is multiplication in Fourier domain. And needless to say, the partial fraction approach is actually a very, very simple approach. It, it doesn't, it, it's basic algebra. Doesn't involve any change of variables, uh, integral by integration by parts and all those uh, funny things we usually do and which takes a lot of time and there is a lot of potential for error. In this case, there is very small, very low potential for error. And even if you make an error, it's very easy to backtrack and figure out where you made the error. So very useful approach. Any questions so far? Now let's look at a natural corollary of what we just did. So now I have a signal xt 
that goes into the first system whose impulse response, or sorry, whose uh, frequency response is given by H1 of J omega. Then it goes through the second system whose uh, frequency response is given by H2 of J omega. And now I want to find the output of this uh, series interconnection. Okay. So, so we know that y of t is given by x of t convolution h1 of t convolution h2 of t. But because convolution in time domain is multiplication in Fourier domain, I get that y of j omega is x of j omega multiplied by h1 of j omega multiplied by h2 of j omega and so on and so forth you can have as many system in series as you want and you don't really have to compute convolution repeatedly uh, it would be very very tedious you just have to multiply the fourier transforms of the impulse responses of individual systems uh, with the input fourier transform of the input signal and then do partial fraction and get the value of y2. From here, you do partial fraction. And from there, you use inverse Fourier transform to get y of t. Okay, I'm going to pause here for questions. Questions on any of the stuff we have done today. So when they're in series, um, we're, we're multiplying them through with the, the convolution technique. Right. If they're in parallel, what are we doing? Then it's just addition. Uh, so addition, okay. Yeah. So you will have, let's say, H1, and you have H2, and you have the same signal, XT, that's going into each of these systems. So then uh, in the time domain, you have Y of T equals to XT convolution H1T plus XT convolution H2T. So in the Fourier domain, you will have y of j omega equals to x multiplied by h1 plus x multiplied by h2. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, let's go back to our expression. So X convolution Y, the Fourier transform is X multiplied by Y. Let's uh, derive this expression now. So I know that X convolution Y at time t is given by negative infinity to infinity x of tau y of t minus tau d tau. So let's look at the Fourier transform of x convolution y t so it's minus infinity to infinity minus infinity to infinity x tau
Okay. So I have double integral. I have an internal integration, which is integration with respect to tau. I have an outside integration, which is an integration with respect to T. And this whole thing is a function of omega. This is a function of actually J omega. So let's look at this double integral. I'm going to open up the bracket. And I'm going to actually flip the integral. So I'll, I'll do the integral, integral with respect to T first, and then I'll do integration with respect to tau. So now, let me just write it. Minus infinity to infinity, x of tau, y of t minus tau, e raised to minus g omega t, dt d tau. I've just changed the order of integration without, I can do it um, without any problem because this is a double integral. So it doesn't matter in which way I integrate. Now I notice that if I'm taking the integration with respect to dt, this term depends on dt, this term depends on dt, uh, sorry, t, time, this term depends on time, but this term, x of tau, this doesn't depend on time, t, so I can take this outside the integral. And so I have minus infinity to infinity, T minus tau dt d tau. Okay, any questions so far? Very straightforward calculation. What is this integral equal to? This is actually the Fourier transform of y t minus tau. Anyone remembers what this is equal to? Let's go back to lecture 17, uh, we talked about time shift. Okay, so what is the time shift thing? So if I take x t minus t naught, the Fourier transform of uh, Fourier transform is e raised to minus j omega t naught. So t naught, this t naught is the same as this t naught here, multiplied by x of j omega. So this is the expression I'm looking at. And I'm going to use that here and I get e raised to minus j omega tau y of j omega. So now let's use this expression. Any, everyone is clear until now? No, no questions? What is this uh, integral equal to? Let's think about it. I'm integrating with respect to tau. This depends on tau, this depends on tau. This one doesn't depend on tau at all. So it's not participating in the integral. I can pull it outside the integral. So I have y of j omega,
and I notice that this integral is exactly the Fourier transform of X. So this is the derivation, took us five minutes and required some minor uh, skills with uh, integration, but not too bad. We got the result that uh, Fourier transform of uh, convolution of two signals in time domain is equal to the multiplication of the Fourier transform of the individual signals. Any questions so far? Okay. Cool, so it looks like we still have about 10, 12 minutes left. So we can talk about the multiplication property. So I have two signals, XT and YT. I multiply them the Fourier transform turns out to be one over two pi integral minus infinity to infinity x of j theta. What's wrong? y of j omega minus theta d theta. This equation is known as the modulation property and the reason for calling it that name is because when you multiply two signals, let's say your x of t is a waveform and you're multiplying it by y of t, it is equivalent to modulating the amplitude. So xt is suppose my original signal I am uh, amplifying it or modulating it using y of t just by multiplying x of t to y of t. This is known as modulating the amplitude of x of t. And therefore, this is known as amplitude modulation.
okay let's consider an example uh, by the way the reason why this relationship holds is because of the duality so you can derive this expression by using by invoking duality between uh, Fourier transform and uh, the time domain characteristics. Okay, let's look at an example. Let's say my x of t is cos omega naught t. and y of t is some signal. Okay, so I have the cos omega naught t, I multiply it by y of t. So therefore I'm modulating the amplitude of cos omega naught t as a function of time. So the amplitude itself is changing as a function of time. Okay, now what is x of j omega? This is the Fourier transform of cos of omega naught t, which is Fourier transform of e raised to j omega naught t plus e raised to minus j omega naught t over two, right? That's the formula for cos theta. What's the Fourier transform of e raised to j omega naught t? Anyone wants to try? Let's go back to lecture 16. So we have a, where did that go? Right, periodic signal, okay. So if my xt is, if my xt is e raised to j omega naught t, this is what my x of j omega going to be. Okay, and we had derived this expression in lecture 16, towards the end of lecture 16. So, so let's use this stuff here. So the Fourier transform of e raised to j omega naught t is two pi delta omega minus omega naught plus two pi delta omega plus omega naught whole divided by two Any question so far? This is fairly straightforward. This is the uh, linearity property of Fourier transform. 
that we are using here. And then y of j omega is whatever y of j omega is. Now let's look at the xt, the Fourier transform of xt multiplied by yt, which is one over two pi integral minus infinity to infinity x of j theta y of j omega minus theta d theta. Pi delta theta minus omega naught plus pi delta theta plus omega naught y of j omega minus theta d theta. Okay. So what would this integral be? I'll let you guys note it down, think about what this integral is equal to. And then someone tell me, what should I write here? Uh, let me remind you that integral of ft delta t minus t naught dt is given by f of t naught. This is uh, from lecture whatever, one, two, or three. Somewhere in that lecture, we had talked about this identity. wants to try. Come on, you guys can tell me the wrong answer. I can correct it right now. Just don't make any mistakes in the exam. Would it be uh, the integral of pi? Okay, let's do integral of pi uh, f uh, F, uh, I'm looking at this integral, right? This this is the integral I'm looking at. Yeah. Oh. So this is delta theta minus omega naught y of j omega minus theta d theta. And then there will be another term, one over two pi. Let's just write it. Okay, so that's what this is equal to. And I'm sure you can recognize that this pi gets canceled. So I'm just left with one over one over two. I'm just looking for what's the integral going to be equal to. Just use this expression. Is that be uh, like y of j theta plus y of negative j theta? So theta gets eliminated, right? Because delta is a function of theta. Oh yeah, so j omega is zero then? Right, right. So I'm just going to replace this theta with omega naught, right? That's what I have to replace the t with t naught that's what i that's what the integral turns out to be so it's the same thing i'm going to do here i have integral with respect to theta and t 
theta, it's theta minus omega naught here. So I'll just replace theta with omega naught. So I get y of j omega minus omega naught plus one half. What about the second part? What should I write here? Y of negative j omega minus omega zero. Uh, it's not negative j, but it's oh, omega cool. plus omega naught. Well, it's omega minus minus omega naught. Well, let me just write it in that fashion. Omega minus minus omega naught. So this is one half y j omega minus omega naught plus y omega plus omega naught. So that's what we get as uh, from the convolution expression. So that's I all. That's all I have for today. Uh, in the next class, we'll talk about filtering, and then we'll start with discrete time Fourier transform. Uh, if you have any questions on the assignment or something, I'll stay back. Otherwise, have a great weekend. See you guys on Monday.